welcome once again to EWTN Spokemark, a special international edition from Melbourne, Australia. Joining us is the author, Bishop Peter J. Elliott. The book, The Sexual Revolution, History, Ideology, Power, published here in the United States by Ignatius Press and available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com for all things Catholic. Uh, it's wonderful uh, to be with you again, Bishop. And I'm pleased to. So you had mentioned uh, when we had the last interview uh, that you were, this was a book that would be coming out in the United States. Now, you actually wrote it a couple of years ago, right? Yes, I, I wrote it, um, completed writing it in 2020, and then it was published in an Australian edition. And now Ignatius Press have taken it up, and I've adapted and updated it for the U.S. version. Okay. Now, you said in the introduction here that I wrote this book to honor the people's right to be informed about what is happening in our society, to help them identify and understand the powerful and wealthy forces at work in the sexual revolution. Are people being not informed? Is that the problem? Certainly, that's the problem. And everybody says, oh, sexual revolution, but they don't understand it. They don't know where it started, where it comes from, how it functions, and where it's leading us, which is the most serious part of all. Right. In the forward as well, uh, which the Archbishop of Hobart uh, put together, Hobart, uh, says, change in sexual mores has become the constant. What was once considered extreme with regard to human sexuality and sexual identity is now a commonplace idea, such as the disturbing fad of gender fluidity. Now, your book is a couple of years old. It just came out in the States. Uh, it, it seems to be a, even a bigger issue today, right? Is the, 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 one of the big problems today, of course, is the gender issue. Mm -hmm. And I even trace the origin of the word gender, which we're all using. We've been conned into that. And, and how that's been manipulated the concept is manipulated particularly by the so-called progressive left and by people who are engrossed in their own problems. And it is a complex problem. And we have to be kind. Right. I'm very clear about that. There's no judgment in this book of that kind. But I do have to spell out the realities. Right. Well, I think you make the great point here right in the beginning. You say the cries for tolerance by some minority groups quickly changes to a demand for total endorsement of their identity and agenda. You go on to say we are being swept away by forces far beyond our capacity to match. Uh, this is actually uh, the Archbishop's quote. But it does seem to be that we, we move rapidly from th that idea we need to tolerate what people are doing to we need to anoint what they're doing. Yes, they, they use the word tolerance, toleration, and especially inclusion. Mm -hmm. But in fact, when you decode that, it means that, say, social conservatives, particularly people of faith, Catholics, evangelicals, and Jews, are excluded. We're mm -hmm. cut out of the thing. And then you also look at the whole world, and there are many countries where the sexual revolution is firmly rejected, particularly in the Islamic world. Right, exactly. You say, that many people would angrily reject my claim to the sexual revolution has any victims at all. For them, it is a great advance in progress, freedom, human rights, in the individual quest for happiness. I think one of the things you, you alluded to earlier, but you do spend a lot of time kind of building back the history, helping people understand where these ideas came from. Why was that important? We don't know where we are or who we are unless we do history. Mm -hmm. Now, I am biased because I'm a historian by first trade before I entered the priesthood. But history decodes what's happening today. Now, the sexual revolution roughly, and you can't be dog dogmatic about this, goes back at least three or four hundred years, mm -hmm. particularly in the cradle of it, which is Europe. Mm -hmm. And in that uh, society, particularly jolted forward by the French Revolution, you have a sudden leap into permissiveness that is decriminalized, as they say, or legalized. And uh, that's really where the trigger begins, and that spreads politically, socially, 
and then through the work and thinking and campaigning of key human beings. Right. For example, the USA is, people know that one of the key people who's a great mover and shaker is Margaret Sanger. Right. And she's responsible for a lot of the major elements of the sexual revolution today. Right. And you make the point, and I thought this was good, I have no doubt in the sincerity of social crusaders, even like a Margaret Sanger, but you go on to point out sincerity is not enough. The misuse of religion demonstrates that principle. Not our good intentions, they are not enough. The worst epitaph one could find on someone's tomb would be, he meant well. But a lot of people do say, well, you know, he's very sincere. His intentions were good. Yes, and, and intentions are not enough. You know, and, and that can get religious people into trouble. Let's face it, we've made big mistakes even in Christ's true church when it comes to dealing with big problems. We've resorted in the past to violence and things like that way back. But those are mistakes and errors, and they're wrong. But today we find that the boot has shifted to the other foot, if I'm use the cliche, mm -hmm. um, and it's the proponents of this that vast social, political, and ideological revolution who are doing that. They're using, in fact, force, obliging people. Now, that's they're going to be, and it is already starting, they're undoing. Mm -hmm. See, let's look at the gender. The gender issues are very popular in a sense. We now have little boys of 12 saying they're really girls and vice versa. And then you have all the issues of child consent and then your treatment. Now, we're getting familiar with that because there's now a pushback and a reaction, mm -hmm. partly legally, which is very interesting, because that little boy who becomes a girl when he's about 25 wants to go back to being a male. But now he, in some countries, like my country, which is very leftist, He's pushed back. He said, oh, no, you can't do that. You can't detransition. Mm -hmm. And that's, this is where things become quite tragic. And that's where the, the sex revolution ha has created not only this weird and even idiotic stuff, um, which has led to problems like the closing of the Tavistock Institute in London, which pushed all this. It's been shut down. Too right. many problems legally, socially. But it's also leading people <clears throat> into suffering. And that's a major theme in my book, that there are many thousands, perhaps millions of victims of the sex revolution in many different ways. Right. You point out, you say, how does the sexual revolution fit into a wider social revolution driven by fashionable woke celebrities, wealthy individuals and interest groups? Is that revolution exploiting homosexuals and transsexuals to further its power goals? Worst of all, is the pedophile agenda emerging again? Is that underneath and behind this? I think it's something that's developing quietly. They're very mm -hmm. discreet. Back in the 70s, Ginsburg and other people, uh, the Sartres and all those, pushed it, but then they backed off. Mm -hmm. Now, because of all the troubles of legalities and cases and the hideous problem of victims, even in the churches, there's a, a, a cringing back from that. But in fact, the agenda is still there. And they now use nice language. You know, you have this LGBTIQ spectrum. Why isn't P in there for pedophile? Logically, it should be. Ah, but it's there in a hidden form. If you go right down the spectrum, it's being suggested MAP, minor attracted persons, right. or intergenerational sex. And that's the door that's being opened by extremists at the moment. But who knows where they're going? They want to take us down that path. Right. You've got this um, somewhat eccentric philosopher in Berkeley in the US, Judith Butler, who's an ultra-feminist. Um, she's a gender feminist. She always referred to herself as they, example. And she believes in child agency, which is another key to opening the door right. to consent by children. But now there's a kickback there, pushback there. The concept of consent is now being discussed in my own country um, as a way of protecting women from uh, rape mm -hmm. or being uh, seduced. And in some ways, that's a good development. We as Christians would say, no, consent is not magic. It doesn't mean you consent to it, it's right. Mm -hmm. The consent is now rising again. 
as a more thoughtful approach to the blight assumptions which did place the benefits, so-called, of the sex revolution into the hands of males. Right. The Absolutely. great winners. Well, you say the French existentialist, and you just mentioned him, uh, Sartre, argued that if there is no God, then everything is permitted, morality is wherever the individual wills. And, of course, his uh, compatriot there, Simone de Beauvoir, in The Second Sex, you talk about how she reworked the, the Marxist class war into a war between the sexes, males oppressing females who need to be liberated. And here we, here we enter, I'm very pleased you've raised this, this is the ideological zone. <clears throat> the main push ideologically comes from the new left, and it can be tracked back to the uh, communist philosopher Gramsci, mm -hmm. the Italian who was murdered by the fascists before the war. Now, he broke with Moscow because he said, violent revolution is not going to work. We're coming out of the Depression. People are getting better situations and conditions. What we need is a way of penetrating the institutions, mm -hmm. infiltrating schools, trade unions, churches, legislative bodies, political parties. And that's the ongoing march through the institutions, it's called. And that's been happening mm -hmm. since Gramsci was around, and that's before the war. Right. And it's now built in what we call woke today, as, as a, or PC, please correct, is the major thrust in the Western world of this insidious social revolution. However, I won't stop there because there's, it's very easy for a social conservative to say, oh, it's all the fault of the, of the neo-Marxists. Mm -hmm. Well, there are people like Marcuse and Derrida and that you can pin that on. But when we get a closer analysis of it, we see how capitalism's come in here because there's big bucks in this actual revolution. And that's, that just can be demonstrated. It's quite obvious when you go and investigate it. Big money. So you have the convergence of a neo-socialism and capitalism, right. which, is, which is a little echo of China. Right. Although the sex revolution doesn't get very far in China, I've noticed. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because you always get that wealthy. And that's where you get the Margaret Sangers and the others who were into population control. And you talk about Malthus as well as in the book. Uh, that, that that kind of comes together. It's And you say here about the idea on shaky foundations in Chapter 3, the rejection of God, a radical change in understanding nature and human persons, and separating human sexuality from fertility, which falls right into that as well, population control. Those are the three main factors that propel the revolution. The elimination of God, atheism in particular, which is a common theme running through the revolution, except when liberal believers, liberal Christians, liberal Jews, uh, liberal Protestants and that fall for it. Some Catholics, for example, since Vatican II, have succumbed to it, think it's okay. But when we get beyond the God fact, we go to the human person, which is the great struggle in our times, as the modern popes all point out, what is a human being? Where are we going? Why are we here? What is my nature? But once you embrace the um, views of the sexual revolution, ideologues, we're anything we like to be. I can choose to be a teapot. I can choose to be a dog, a cat, but particularly I can choose to be a different gender, which is the code word of the sex. Then you get to that third area. What made the revolution possible? Two key factors, abortion and contraception. Contraception, especially since 1959 with the contraceptive pill and abortion, which is being pushed all around the world. And I live in a country where some of our sovereign states have the most permissive abortion laws in the world. Right. That's how bad it is. Now, you talk about even the idea of pornography and it, the pervasiveness of that. And to jump ahead into the, the discussion kind of of this postmodernism that we're experiencing and to, to uh, Foucault and the idea, I am what I think I am or I am what I feel I am, right? And that's the identity. If you decode this a question, demand for identity, that's what it is. I am what I think I am. And so if, if you start following that logically, 
we'd have to be treating people seriously who think they're Napoleon or Queen Elizabeth I. And we have to be kind to people with those delusions and care for them. That's the pastoral challenge at all levels. But you don't take that seriously or rationally. But reason has been thrown out the door too. There's no rationality here. That's well, what, one of the things that struck me too is you, 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 that you talk about in the postmodernism the idea it, it, it's like two ends of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum is total autonomy. I, I, I'm an individual. I can do and be whatever I want to be. But yet there's this kind of collective uh, pressure to conform to certain mores that the, that the postmodernists have now come up with. Yeah, and that's the paradox of, uh, for example, the, the, the movements on the political left, that there's all this autonomy, which links up with ultra-liberalism, strangely enough. But when you put it together, you have the herd mentality set again, conformism mm -hmm. to permissiveness, which is the massive problem in your nation and my nation, and in fact, all the so-called developed nations of the world today. The herd mentality marries autonomy, and they work together, which is another paradox. Right. But it's disastrous right. when you think right. of it. Absolutely. Right. You talk about the targets for uh, uh, that uh, exists in culture uh, to change the culture. The, the hits go against the family, the educational institutions, and religion. And of course, John Dewey believed the way to change a society wasn't through politics, it was through education. And we've seen a lot of where these ideas, you know, show up all of a sudden and are popularized, are really coming out of the educational systems. The educational system is one of the key areas. And that's why it is extremely worrying when the schools are penetrated by these ideologies. And even, I must regret to say, in my own city, a prominent Catholic high school mm -hmm. has succumbed to it because one of the teachers now comes to school wearing a dress, and he's a man. Mm -hmm. And they're trying in the name of tolerance to tell the boys this man must be tolerated, but then it topples over into approval. And that's why the Catholic uh, Dicastery for Education in the Vatican has issued pastoral guidelines to help parents with the problem of children who think they're the opposite sex work through that, and also tell the schools clearly Look after everyone, look after the particular cases, but don't condone it, mm -hmm. is not Catholic teaching. All the modern popes have been clear about that. Right. Francis, Benedict, John Paul II. And the catechism is crystal clear right. about sexual identity. Right, absolutely. And you, you mentioned it earlier, chapter seven, you, you, you talk about a harvest of suffering, and you were talking about that's what your concern is, all the people have had to suffer. What is part of the harvest of suffering in your mind? The harvest of suffering is the breakup of the family, obviously, uh, the destruction of the life of a child who becomes an adolescent and secretly associates with people of low morality behind parents' backs. And these are the things that are impacting on the family. But above all, the easy access now to pornography. Mm -hmm. You can pick up your phone and get it. Right. You can get it by accident in the internet. You can get it. It's always, a, and there's big money in that. Don't tell us the criminal element's not still there. It is. And that means the corrupting of young people, the breakup of the family, and then this reluctance to make the commitment right. to marry. Right. And the, the, the guy who has a woman as his so called wife or partner right. has a baby and then dumps her probably after belting her up with violence. It's all yeah. linked up. These are the bad things. And he thinks it's okay because the sex revolution is telling him, oh, you're autonomous, you can do what you like, and blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. You, you talk about it in the chapter there about the collapse of personal morality. Uh, responsible yeah. means parenthood means resorting to contraception sterilization. Duty now means tolerating everything and everyone. Sacrifice means giving up the husband, wife, or children you love because your spouse moved on or obtained an easy di divorce or uh, in the name of the family law or even gained a divorce online. You go on to also talk about, in, in a related vein, situational ethics, and, and especially because this, this hits 
upon, as you say here, explains why some liberal Protestants and Anglicans endorse same-sex marriage, submitting to the sub-scientific doctrines of gender fluidity. Uh, the Church of England provided a, a service of blessing, a quasi-baptism to celebrate uh, completed transition from one gender to another. But it's not only affecting the mainline Protestant churches, it seems like, as you've already alluded to, it, it's affecting the Catholic Church as well, right? We have to be honest, it is. I can name Catholic moralists after Vatican II, particularly in Germany, who threw this open, threw the doors open to the sex revolution in the critical 60s. And uh, that spread through the church. You have various moralists in the United States who are really working on loophole casuistry, we'd call it, always finding excuses and ways through sexual moral dilemmas, which are not dilemmas because we just go along with the flow. And this is a problem, uh, obviously, it's a problem for liberal Jews, liberal Protestants and liberal Catholics. Uh, by and due, there are liberal Catholics, I'd be fair here, who do not accept the sex revolution mm. at all. And uh, a lot of them are rethinking right. their position. Let, let me ask you, Bishop, because you're unique, you have a unique perspective on this. Uh, you look at some of the, uh, let's say, aping that the church might do of what other mainline Protestant churches and have secular society has done. It doesn't seem like these changes or the accepting uh, the, these lifestyles have suddenly generated renewed interest in that particular church or increased the number of people going or the fervency of their faith. If, if it doesn't work elsewhere, why do the people inside the Catholic Church think it's going to have a positive effect in the Catholic Church? Well, a lot of them are people even as old as me, and I'm heading for 80, and we are the generation that uh, came immediately after or during the Council, mm -hmm. and, and we have uh, been influenced by the so-called spirit of Vatican II, which is nothing to do with the Council mm -hmm. when you look at it. And therefore, these ideas are regarded as fresh and positive and forward-looking, and they're not. They're out of date. Because mm -hmm. if you look at the practice rate of Catholics, which has dropped in so many countries, not all countries, mm -hmm. you found that the people who are practicing are conservative or traditionalist Catholics. And that's one of the big uh, argument areas about the traditional Latin mass. Why are there so many young families going down to the parish of St. John Newman, next to where I live, mm -hmm. which is the Latin Mass Parish in Melbourne, set aside for that. Why are so many young families there on Sunday? The same goes if you go into the Protestant communities. Why are the evangelicals and Pentecostals booming? Mm -hmm. And the liberal parishes or communities are shriveling. Right. And that's, that's, that's... Religious sociologists are coming to grips with that now. I hope mm -hmm. so. Right. You, you have near the end of the book, Chapter 8, Strategies to Bring Down the Revolution, and you talked about some signs of hope in our in our last two minutes. Do you want to give us some hope? Yes, I would say the signs of hope are that the family is mobilizing slowly to meet the challenge mm -hmm. and working out ways of coping within your home. That's the real battleground is the family. <clears throat> There's the Benedict option, and that means locking the doors, putting up the foot colors. That has a, a, a function. You've got to keep evil things out of your house, particularly with children. And at the same time, however, we are called to be the salt and the leaven in society. So if there's a, a move in your neighbourhood to open a sex shop around the corner, you get into the community group and push with it to block that. And you can often do that. And, and also we see the signs of hope with the pushback against abortion, which I think is a welcome trend in your own country. Right. Are you seeing, because we are seeing, and you alluded to it earlier in a sense, uh, with some of the transitional things and, and the, the higher suicide rate and depression and, and, and people wanting to, if they could, you know, go back to what they were before. Are you seeing that in Australia as well? Yes, we are. And we've, we've, we've always had the tragedy that so many transsexuals uh, become suicidal. Mm -hmm. And that has to be researched. I don't know whether the research has been done, some areas perhaps. The standard um, answer that's given, oh, people commit suicide in these communities because everybody persecutes them and picks mm -hmm. on them. 
I don't think that's true because there's not massive persecution or even prejudice against transsexuals and the adult transsexual who made a transition as an adult. Uh, you have to respect right. that person, right. even if you strongly disagree. You, uh, they're not being picked on. But this is another game that the PC woke people play. First of all, oh, I'm so offended, and then I'm a victim. How can you do this to me? I'm suffering. It's your fault. And it's not. Right. This, well, but that's to get the sympathy. Right. And what's interesting is uh, the studies out of Sweden, which is not exactly a, a country known for uh, its conservatism, found out the uh, suicide rates are just as high there. So it has nothing or very little to do with the culture's uh, persecution of the, the person in need. So with that said, we appreciate your time, Bishop Peter J. Elliott, for joining us from Melbourne, Australia, the book, The Sexual Revolution. We could it's a lot of inter interesting information, history, ideology, power, all covered, published by Ignatius, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog. Pick it up there at EWTNRC.com. I'm Doug Keck. Thanks for joining us right here on Bookmark. See you next time.